In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about space complexity and present a few interesting results without proofs. I'm also going to talk about the graph isomorphism problem, which is interesting in its own right. So let's talk about space complexity. Up until now, we've talked about time complexity, which is the amount of time it takes for a program to run. When we talk about space complexity, we talk about how many cells of the Turing machine's tape actually got used or actually got visited. So uh, after an algorithm runs, we can imagine that some of these cells were visited, they were read or, 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 or possibly modified, but the infinite tape contains an infinite number of blank cells out here, and these are not ever visited. So we can divide the tape into that portion that was visited and that portion that was not ever visited. And um, we can define the class pspace as the number of algorithms that visit a polynomial number of cells. Okay, the length of the input is n, so a polynomial um, as a function of the length of the input. How many uh, cells are visited, and we can define the class of pspace as a set of algorithms that be can be done that visit only a polynomial number of cells of the tape. And then we can ask the question, what is the relationship between p, okay, these are the problems that can be executed in polynomial time, and pspace, and these are the problems that visit a polynomial number of cells in the tape. What is the relationship between p and p-space? To answer this question, notice that an algorithm that uses, for example, 30 tape cells has to use at least 30 time steps. It takes at least one step to visit each new cell. Okay? But an algorithm that uses 30 tape cells may use many more steps than that. So the relationship between these two classes is one of subset. P is a subset of P space. Well, most problems are in the class NP, but it turns out that there are some problems that are in P space for which there is no known NP algorithm. Some problems are in the class P space, and for these problems there is no known NP algorithm. So I'm going to next talk about an example of a problem that is in this. Um, to introduce this problem, um, I'm going to talk about a game that kids might play while they're on a long trip uh, riding in the backseat of a car. Okay, And here's how the game works. There are two players, and they alternate. Uh, each player, when it's his or her turn, says the name of a geographic place, such as the name of a city. Okay, And the next player has to say another city name that begins with the letter that the first city or the previous city ended with. So, for example, player one may start the game by saying Portland. That ends with a D. And the next player tries to think of a city, and they may think of the city Denver, which begins with a D begins with a D, Portland ends with a D. Now Denver ends with an R, so player it's player's one turn, it's player's one player one's turn again. So player one has to think of something that begins with the last letter of Denver, which is R, and, and maybe they say Rio. And this goes along until one player gets stuck. And one key fact is that each word can only be used once. And to make this uh, more formal, um, in the in the in the well, to make it less formal, when we're playing it in the car, we just assume that uh, everybody knows what the cities are, and it's a question of whether you can think of cities or not. But to do this on a computer, we're going to establish a a, a list of valid words that can be used or valid city names. So we assume there's a list or a dictionary of, of valid words, and the list itself constitutes a problem. And the problem is this. Given the dictionary, or the list of, of legal words, 
can the first player win if that first player chooses his first word correctly? So this is a question of whether the game is a, a win for the first player if the first player chooses the word correctly. And so this is an example of a problem that is in p-space, but for which there is no known NP algorithm. What we're getting at is that these problems seem to require exponential time um, on any machine, and the non-determinism somehow doesn't help. This problem of the guessing game is sort of a special case of uh, the min-max search problem, or and or tree search problem. Um, sort of the nature of it is uh, the formula, there exists an x such that for all x2, there exists an x3 such that for all x4. This is the min-max search problem. And um, <clears throat> it's used in, in, in game theory. Uh, let's say you're playing a game like chess or checkers or something like that. Um, you want to know whether uh, this move or that move is good. Um, so it, it's non-determinism doesn't really seem to help trim the search time. You just have to do the full search. So the idea is you guess a good move for me, but then you have to check all of your opponent's possible moves. And then to check those, you have to guess another good move for me, and then check all possible counter moves. And so non-determinism may help in the guessing part, but the checking all possible moves, counter moves, doesn't, the non-determinism doesn't really help in that, that sort of uh, thing, in that sort of, that part of the problem. <clears throat> Here is um, a tree, and this is not a computation history, but instead this is a, a game tree, um, and at each level, one person moves. So for example, at this, per at, at this level, I move, and I have three choices. And then at each sub-layer, at each other layer, the opponent moves. And he might have three, if I move here, he might have three moves. Or if I move here, he might have three moves. And then it's my turn to move again. So you can maybe guess a good move to find out whether we're going to win. You, it's nice to guess the winning move. But your opponent is assumed to be good and tricky, and uh, will do the exact best thing. So you have to check all of his uh, possible counter moves. And so um, this is basically a, an algorithm that has to search a tree, and the tree is exponential in size. And so we have to store this tree, uh, but we, we can't store the tree. Um, this is a p-space algorithm. Um, so we have to basically since it's a p-space algorithm, we can't, we don't have enough space to store the tree, so we have to search the tree. We have to do a depth for a search of the tree, and the time taken to search this tree is is, is exponential. So that's the the nature of the problem here. This sort of problem seems to require exponential time. Guessing is not good. We have good enough. The non-determinism doesn't help us. We still have to search the tree, and um, so we have to build it and search it. And uh, so this is uh, interesting, an interesting problem. Here's another interesting problem. It's called the graph isomorphism problem. So the problem is, given two graphs, can you match them up? Okay, here's a graph G1, and here's a graph G2. They have the same number of nodes and the same number of edges, but can you, can you match them up? And in this case, the answer is, is yes. If we take graph G2 and we redraw it, um, putting T4 above T3 and uh, moving T1 and T2 over to the other side uh, and keeping the edges the same, uh, we see that graph G1 lines up with graph G2. And so there's a correspondence. And the correspondence is S1 lines up with T4, S2 lines up with T3, um, and S3 lines up with uh, T1, and S4 lines up with 
t2. So that is a solution for 3, 1, 2. But here's another pairing. If we try to line up s1 with t1, s2 with t2, s3 with t3, s4 with t4, then no, it's not a correspondence. So, um, so the question is, are two graphs isomorphic? It, this problem is, is in NP. Okay, given an answer, that, that's our certificate. The answer is in the form of a correspondence. Okay, a number like 4312. Okay, we can then check and verify in polynomial time whether that is a solution. So this problem is in NP. Interestingly enough, this is an example of a problem that is not in the class NP complete. Um, now, there's another problem, the, sort of the opposite problem or the complementary problem. Given two graphs, the question is not whether they're isomorphic, but whether they're not isomorphic. Okay? Uh, turns out this problem is not even in NP. There are in factorial different possible combination uh, correspondences, and you, you just have to check each one of them. Um, Non-determinism doesn't really help. You you just really have to check everything. So you you need exponential time to do it, even if you have a non-deterministic Turing machine. You can't do it in polynomial time on a non-deterministic Turing machine. You need exponential time. Well, I'm going to wrap up this series of videos with uh, some results without giving any proofs, but uh, just giving the results. But first, let me uh, define again for you uh, some of the classes of problems that we're interested in. We've talked about P and NP and the others. P is a class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time on a deterministic Turing machine. NP is the class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time on a non-deterministic Turing machine. P space is a set of time uh, of problems that can be solved using an amount of tape that's polynomial in terms of the size of the input. So we don't really care whether it's deterministic or non-deterministic. Exponential time are those problems that can be can be solved by a deterministic Turing machine in exponential time. And there's also an exponential um, space. So uh, these are problems that can be solved using an exponential amount of space on the tape by a deterministic Turing machine. So here these results are. And here's what we know. We know that P is a subset of NP, possibly proper, possibly uh, not. Um, we know that NP is a subset of P space. We know that P space is a subset of exponential time, and that's a subset of the problems that require exponential space on the Turing machine. We also know that P is a proper subset of exponential time, okay? Um, but we don't know whether p equals np or whether np equals exponential time. And we also know that p space is a proper subset of exponential space. Well, without any proof, I'm going to uh, close off this series of videos and say um, thank you for watching. And I, I, this is fascinating material, and uh, perhaps you'll uh, go further in this. If not, I hope uh, all of this information has tickled your brain. I know it's very interesting material and uh, it's uh, been fun. So thanks for watching.